Hey, I'm Alex with JV Supply and Columbia Safety and Supply, and we are here in our newest training facility located just outside of Los Angeles in Corona, California. Ideally, we'd like to invite everyone out to come visit us in person for a uh, normal grand opening, but in the interest of safety, we decided to host this series of virtual YouTube live training events. Welcome to our Southern California facility, located just outside of Los Angeles in Corona, California. This is our first facility on the West Coast and has helped us shave days off our time in transit for customers out West. As with our other locations, it features a stock showroom, indoor training center, warehousing facility, and option for curb or dockside pickup. GME Supply and Columbia Safety and Supply are America's premier outfitters for fall protection, safety equipment, and gear for at-height workers. We keep workers safe and productive on the job by offering customers timely service and expertise. Our gear experts are here to be an extension of your safety program, offering solutions and consulting in any way possible, and to make sure your gear is here when you need it. One of the best ways we can do that is through our national network of distribution locations and training facilities. Everyone expects to be able to order something online or through a gear expert and get it in just a day or two, and that's what our national footprint allows us to do. Let's take a look at time and transit for standard ground shipping from our various locations beginning with our headquarters centrally located in Columbia, Missouri. We're local to the heart of America. Our second location opened in Atlanta, Georgia in 2015 to service the East Coast and Southeastern U.S. In 2018, our location in the heart of Texas opened in Dallas, further establishing our southern presence. And this year, we opened this location in Corona, as well as just a couple months ago, a location in Denver, Colorado. As you can see, the majority of the U.S. population is within a two-day ground shipping point from one of our locations, meaning you don't have to pay extra to expedite shipments. And look for our quick ship items, which ship the same day as long as the order is placed by 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Monday through Friday. Thanks for tuning in today, and enjoy the exclusive training session ahead. Today's exclusive YouTube live training features Safety LMS and JP Jones. JP is going to run through some of the most frequently asked questions that come out of their competent rigor course. Without further ado, let's get to the training. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, as you heard, we're here in our latest training facility uh, located in Corona, California, and uh, glad that everyone's here watching live and uh, down the road if you can't make it at the moment. Uh, here with JP Jones from Safety LMS. Thanks for joining us. Uh, do you want to give a quick intro to yourself and kind of what Safety LMS is all about? Uh, so my name is JP Jones. I started in the tower industry in 1975 at a very young age. Uh, still working in high school, uh, counting nuts and bolts and grease and hoists and backhoes. And, and I've been in the industry over 45 years now. And I started training in uh, the late 90s. Uh, I've been training for about 20 years now in the, in the uh, fall protection, rescue, and, and rigging training sectors uh, for construction and tower telecommunication towers. So uh, we started uh, Safety LMS, we call it 2.0, uh, in 2015 with GME Supply as our, uh, as our partner, and we've uh, enjoyed substantial growth over the years. Uh, we got a very hardworking team, proud of all the people that has helped bring us to where we are now, and we're enjoying these wonderful facilities like the new one here in Corona, California that we just uh, I broke the champagne bottle over the bow a couple of days ago, so this is a, a new one. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about our facilities later on. Perfect. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, jump into some of the questions. So we kind of curated these from uh, all of the various competent rigging courses that you've taught over the years, the most frequently asked questions. So the first one we've got is uh, load testing versus proof loading. There is some frequent confusion uh, where some techs don't know the differences, I guess, between the two when it comes to rigging and the associated forces. So what are the differences between load testing and proof loading, and what should be taken into account uh, when considering those two? That's a great question. Uh, 
So the, the first thing is to understand proof loading is proof loading is typically on one particular device, whether that be uh, an installed anchor on a rooftop, whether it be a shackle or a bolt or whatever. Proof, proof loading is typically a static test that's done to 1.1 to 1.5 times the ultimate load of that particular device, uh, the maximum allowable force on that device, uh, to a point where uh, it safely manages to load without uh, losing the uh, elasticity or yielding to a point where the bolt stretches and doesn't come back into shape. Uh, that's basically proof loading. OSHA mandated uh, a big proof loading uh, mandate in the final working uh, final rule on walking working surfaces in 2017 when they mandated that all rooftop anchors uh, be proof load certified annually, which that's a, that's a big deal. Uh, there's uh, some confusion uh, as far as, you know, what those numbers should be. If it's a 5,000 pound anchor, it's a single person anchor, and you have to pull it to 5,000 pounds. Uh, as far as load testing goes, the, the, the trial lift load it's what we do in the tower industry per the ANSI 1048 standard. And that is 1.5 times the maximum allowable line pull or projected calculated line pull for that job. And this is the entire lifting system. So once the system is connected to the tower and constructed, then our load has to be picked up to 1.5 times the maximum line pull of that job. So load is the system, proof load is an individual component. That's the basics. Got it. Okay. And then another thing to consider uh, when you're lifting these types of loads is the travel path of a system when it's under load. So when you're setting up one of these systems, what might that path look like? Um, and then when it's under load, there you know could be obstacles that wouldn't be necessarily there um, if you're just looking at the, the path before it's actually weighted. So What's the best way to plan for these potential path obstacles and what consideration should be made when putting together your rigging plan before actually executing the lift? Yeah, another great question. Um, one of the situations that most uh, wireless LTE uh, 4G, 5G crews always face is congested area sites where they don't have enough room to tag or they don't have access to the base of the tower to put a floor block. So they have uh, become very used to working off the capstan itself in a what we call a skate. Uh, there's confusion as to what a trolley is. Most of the crews out there are calling it a trolley, but it's, it is truly what we call a skate system. Uh, that system, you don't have control over where that load goes. Once it finds its center point in the lifting, in the, in the lifting system, as it leaves the ground, it only tracks on one path till it gets to the top. So the best way to, to find these out is back at that load test. So when we pick that load up and we do our 1.5, you have to imagine uh, and kind of visualize, once we pick it up, you'll see that trolley move in or that skate move in to the point where it, now it's, it's centered, it's got its balance point on that lifting system and it's gonna begin to track up. Uh, I see a lot of crews placing that load too close to the back of the vehicle that they're using as their as their hoist anchor for their capstan and as they start to pick it up it drags across the ground on its way back to the tower before it ever leaves the ground so a nice slow easy pick on that kind of will establish where that really launch spot needs to be right so you can kind of nail that down before you really start the lift and then it's always best to have a crew member on the tower uh, that can visualize something from the top. If there's uh, a congested site where we've got, you know, large antennas and, and uh, carrier platform levels in place that, you know, can obstruct our vision, uh, that's where you're going to find the rubbing points at the very top block. You know, it's really easy to get into a situation with the top block uh, to rub. So when we rub, not only do we wear and potentially get into a, a, an abrasive or cutting situation with our with our soft ropes, our synthetic ropes, um, but we also get into a situation that when when something rubs on it, it increases the load that's on the on the hoisting system. So the best way to do it is to take it nice and slow and have lots of eyes. And I always recommend a good set of binoculars on every tower crew to see what's going on there. And then once the load leaves the ground 
good communication between the hoist operator and the, and the crew on top. Uh, as they see something, if it starts to go bad, you know the rule, stop, drop, load back down to the ground, clear it. The second thing is bad habits. Uh, and bad habits, in, in my opinion, are, uh, I, I tend to see crews uh, avoiding climbing down the structure to put a hand on a load to, to help it out around an obstruction or another antenna mount or something like that. They tend to stay on top and, you know, expect the man on the tag to magically pull that load out away. Well, not only are we increasing our, our gross load when we do that, uh, it's a lot easier to climb down 20, 30, 40 feet, pull the load out, let it get above the mount, free it up, and then, you know, creep it up. If it takes slow, easy movements, that's what it takes. It's, it's a lot better to be safe than it is to be fast. Yeah, and that's a perfect transition to this next question, which is the total gross load of a lift. You know, it's more than just the antenna or the structural element or whatever you're taking up tower. So you need to consider a lot of other factors. What's the best way to safely calculate your gross load weight and what things could, should be considered when you're determining that weight? Yeah, these are really great questions. Uh, so number one, the gross load, the lifted load is everything combined. It's not just the weight of, of the load itself. Uh, if we're multi-parting the rope, if we've got uh, a tower rigged at 500 feet and we have uh, a two-part system in there to cut our line pull in half. You're uh, just talking like a mechanical advantage where you've right. got a couple blocks. In right, the exactly, yeah. a traveling block. So that'd give us two parts of line, cut, cut our, our line pull and our line speed in half as well. Uh, but So we have one line going up to the top block another one coming back down to the traveling block and the other side going up the tower to be anchored. So that's three parts of line. So you got 1,500 feet of load line there. So that 1,500 feet of load line, that's one component all the way to that. Then everything that's in the connecting system. So that traveling block has weight. These blocks that are on the table we're going to talk about in a little while, they're fairly heavy. So all the connecting components, shackles, slings, traveling blocks, things like that, that are in that part of that lifting system all have to be calculated. And then the, the most important part is knowing truly what those weights are. Uh, if you have to get an inline load scale and pick something up and really get an accurate load weight on that, then that's really what's necessary. Uh, it's a little easier with, uh, you know, guys that, crews that are repetitively working in and say for a certain carrier and they use a certain package, this pipe, this antenna, this RRU, right, all that, the jumpers, they can weigh that one time and then they get that in their head, hey, this is 312 pounds, sure. right? But accurately knowing those weights is, is very key to this. Yeah, and then uh, kind of an extension of that question, there are other factors to consider uh, to make sure you're not overloading the system, things like tag forces um, and wind shear and that sort of thing. So. Um, What's, what's the best way to factor those into your rigging plan? The, uh, I'm, I'm coming back with a lot of negatives. I'm going to start with the negative. What causes a problem, right? Uh, one of the things that we see constantly is uh, the use of a straight tag. So a straight tag is simply a tag line, a rope tied to the load directly and then back down to the, to the ground to the tag person, whether he's using some type of mechanical advantage to gain some strength there, to, to have some resistance on the tag. It could be uh, taking some wraps, you know, on the bumper of the truck. It could be running through a shackle. It could be I've seen using it. wrap them around a tree even. Uh, I've seen <laughs> it, yeah, it will, you'll see it all, Yeah. right? But the thing about the straight tag is if the angle of the tag, if the tag man stays in one spot, as the angle increases, so does the tag load. So when we go from 30 degrees to 75 degrees, we have a tremendous increase in tag force that's being added to the lifting system. So the winch is working harder and harder and harder. So the best way to do it with a straight tag is to get the tag as far back as you possibly can. You know, if you can get the tag two or 300 feet back, man, go for it. It's just easy, because now we're still pulling out. When we quit pulling the load out from the tower and we start pulling the load down, that's when our tag scale goes through the roof. 
Uh, the other thing is to learn how to use a dedicated tag system. And that is where we dead end the rope on the tower uh, at the load point. And then that, lo that load line comes down to the ground to a point when it, where it can be loosened or tightened and, and that puts a belly in that tag. So we put a block on that tag line and then the load simply rides up that rope. And if yeah. we need to come, the load to come out, we tighten up on that and it comes back. But we're not adding load or tag force to the load. We're, at, we're putting that on the tower structure, which minimizes everything. So if you can start using dedicated tags like that, you're gonna be well, well off uh, in the future. Perfect. And so this next one, it might seem like kind of a, a basic concept, but it's an easy one to overlook, especially if you're trying to work faster. You've done this same thing over and over again, um, and that's sling angles. And that's obviously a really important thing. Can you go over why it's crucial to think about sling angles when you're rigging a load uh, and how that could make the job more difficult or uh, potentially dangerous if your sling angles are wrong? Yeah, sling angles are very, very critical in any lifting situation. Uh, for the simple fact that uh, the taller the angle, the less force. So the, the, when the angle starts to get shallow, the forces in that system, especially on the connecting points to the load, this being the, the hook, uh, increase tremendously. So having uh, a sling angle of 60 degrees, which we call the perfect rigging triangle, all sides being equal and equilateral, uh, that gives us a calculating moment of 1.15. If we take that 60 and we lay that thing down to 30, that lobe, that uh, calculating moment goes up to 2.0. So when it, you're lifting a 5,000 pound load, I've got two slings and a 90, that's 5,000 on each leg. The further I lay them down, the more that number increases. So when I put it at, at 30, now each one of these slings is seeing double the load. Mm -hmm. So it takes 10,000 pounds to lift 5,000 pounds. It's a matter of, force it's not a matter of weight the load doesn't increase itself in weight the forces on the rigging system increase so sling angles are very very critical uh, your sling angle at the top block at the at the floor blocks if those angles are wrong the forces being applied to the tower legs can be tremendous and if it's a, a really heavy load such as in the broadcast world when we're picking up you know 20,000 pound antennas these are numbers that can collapse the tower uh, mm -hmm. we've had some serious uh, fatalities over the last few years from, uh, you know, rigging accidents, rigging failures. So we want to make sure that we understand the, the sling angle calculations uh, uh, over over everything. That's a really, really critical thing. Yeah, it's all preventable. You just need to make sure Absol you know your numbers. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And how about uh, sling angles when you're talking about eye bolts or how the sling is actually connected to the load? So eye bolts are they're not real common in our industry. We, we understand that, but there are instances where they're used. And so every component in that system, we need to have a chart for, right? So in that eye bolt, when we're at 90 degrees, we've got a lot of strength. We're at 100% here. As we start to lay that thing down, when we get to 45 degrees on an eye bolt, we've lost 75% of our, of our strength. So if that sling angle continu continues to decrease and get shallower, then that component of that eye bolt needs to increase in size to do that. And we're not saying that lifting a load with two slings at 30 degrees is bad because sometimes we have to do that to get a large load into a, a small area. Right? We may have to lay our slings down. It's not that it's not bad, it's just that we have to calculate and build that rigging system to allow us to do that. Sure. Cool. So we got uh, about 10 minutes or so left. Um, got a couple shorter ones. So uh, something that's happening a lot more is uh, loads being lifted in the industry are getting lighter as antennas are getting smaller and that sort of thing. Um, what are some things that can be done by a crew to make sure the load they're lifting that might only be a couple hundred pounds um, is still being lifted correctly and there's not a chance that the load could be damaged or dropped? Yeah, another great one. Uh worked with a lot of carriers and all the tower owners over the years and the largest problem that they see is drop loads right and sometimes they're light sometimes they're extremely heavy being you know some of these mounts and sectors frames are weighing in at 1800 pounds right uh, it's easy to it's easy to drop something when you're lifting with synthetic rope at that weight but one of the things that's out there are these little small 
Dyneema slings, right? They're very, very strong, uh, but they're small, right? And some of these antennas, even if they're a couple of hundred pounds, uh, you know, the antenna and the pipe and the clamps, I see guys, you know, choking these around the top of the antenna clamp. And a lot of those antenna clamps are simply pressed steel, meaning that the edges are very sharp. So when we look at things like this, I tend to take those and that's used to tie my bolt bags off on the tower with. I don't want to see that in my lifting system. Um, when we're looking at a, a, a larger sling like this, you've got a lot more to cut here than here. So if you get into an abrasive or a cutting situation, my theory is, and this is safety LMS motto when we teach rigging, is go big. Uh, if you have, uh, you do your calculations and it says I need a half inch sling, but I've got a three quarter inch sling in the box, get the three quarter. It's not the bit insurance. There's no wrong you're going to do by going big and upsizing your rigging. So I say stay away from the small stuff, even though it's light. If it's 100 pounds, treat it like it's 400 pounds. Perfect. Um, finally, one thing is inspection. So as you know, all equi equipment needs to be inspected before it's being used. Um, what are some things that, you know, they might be inspecting their slings, but what are some other things that need to be considered when you're going through your inspection before doing a lift? Yeah, the, uh, the manufacturers will always have uh, three things in their paperwork. How to use it, how to maintain it, and how to inspect it. Uh, that needs to be your basis to, f to follow when you're inspecting this individual component. So when we have soft products like synthetic slings, some of those become uh, a little more difficult to inspect, such as these endless slings, because the fibers that are carrying the load are inside this sheath. You can't put your eyes on them, so you really have to do it by feel. Uh, you're looking for flat spots. You're looking for uh, bunched up spots, like a knot in it. It'll feel like there's a rock in there. Those are fibers that are pulled and then come back together in a ball. Uh, they're obviously have lost their strength at that point. Uh, anything that's cut, frayed, torn, you know, soft goods are, are obviously the first thing that goes away as far as in, in our world, you know, even if you look at, at an ice bridge, the top of that ice bridge is nothing but a bunch of razors. So if something runs across there in a soft good, even your harness, if you're sitting on it, you're scooting around, you may not know it, but you're cutting the fibers in your harness on your seat. Well, even things like labels on blocks and even on the slings, you need to make sure that those are legible too, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, ASME B30, we'll talk about blocks here a little bit more, but ASME B30 is our, is our Bible for, for rigging and blocks and things like that. So follow the B30 standard for inspection on, on blocks and, and heavy rigging yeah. your, your steel components. And I know, I've heard you talk about um, if you're using a capstan, making sure that the actual hitch on the truck is mounted correctly. You know, if somebody borrowed a bolt or something, I, I don't know, but that's, that's a piece of your rigging plan, right? It is, and, and that's a good one because uh, we had a, uh, we were very fortunate at Safety LMS to be able to be a partner with uh, Warriors for Wireless. And uh, when we first started this, uh, this program years back, uh, one of our very first classes, we had a training partner in Dallas that was uh, hosting our, our, our classes there and they had a fleet of brand new trucks. So they had a real nice big huge warehouse. They, they backed a couple of trucks in. Uh, there was one truck sitting over to the side that was obviously a crew truck that was being used. And then the, the truck that we had attached the capstan hoist to the receiver hitch on that particular truck was brand new. It still had the paper on the window. And uh, started getting ready to, uh, you know, move forward with the lift training and said, why don't you guys, why don't you guys get on your back and crawl under there and, and look, at, uh, look at the bolts on the receiver on the bolt to the frame and see what you see. Not knowing that there's a problem. Um, so he caught, crawls under and I said, how many bolts you got? Uh, six. And are they all tight? He goes, yeah, they look all good. I said, how many holes are down there? <laughs> he said, uh, 12. So one of the other guys said, go look at that other truck, the one that was being used that got under their 12 bolts connected. So that truck came from the factory with half the bolts in the hitch, right? The other thing to understand about, about that when you're looking at it, it's not a one-time thing because the trailer hitches, the receivers, they're meant to be used in inline pull, direct pull, pulling that trailer down the road. They were never designed to have a capstan slid in 
and then for us to be pulling at a 45 degree angle straight off that capstan. So that hitch is going like this for a good portion of its life. So every day, every time you go to a job site, it's easier to do out on the dry road than it is the muddy site. So just, you know, keep it. But that's something that really needs to be paid attention to. We've seen it a lot. Perfect. Uh, and then finally, the last question is, what kind of common mistakes do you see when crews or companies are purchasing and using rigging equipment? That's probably my favorite question. Um, the first thing is, I'll split it into two. We're going to talk about blocks and we're going to talk about the rigging itself, the slings. So in the steel environment where we're working with IWRC, Independent Wire Rope Core Slings, uh, what I see the most is uh, crews, and not necessarily the crew's fault, but I'm, I'm kind of going to blame it on the person that's doing the purchasing. So this is an example of a Flemish die sling. This is a Flemish eye, right? What I see is this being the common sling that's out there. That's common because a lot of these are over the counter. They're already made. I'll take a 3 8 by 6 foot. It's already there. But when you take it out into the field and you use it with a shackle or a connector, very, very rarely would we ever use a, a sling like this and not have a connector in, the, in line. So what happens is we need this. We need a thimble eye, not the Flemish eye. The Flemish eye works good if I'm sticking this on a crane hook that's four or five inches wide. I'm not gonna lose my D to D here, my diameter to diameter ratio. So that's critical in maintaining that. So Connor, would you, uh, would you bring up, just give us about you know, four seconds on, on those rigging slides. We've got some to show you. So that's, uh, that's the winch, let's go to the OSP1. So this is what happens when you use a component such as a shackle and then you place this sling in a load in line, it kinks the end of that shackle, and um, into that sling and typically this is probably done on the very first day with a brand new sling. So you can see in this one, this is what happens. It deforms the end of the sling, the wires and the strands become uh, out around and it, instantly you lose capacity when that happens. This is the inside of the same sling that was just being held up and you can see broken wires on the inside and a flat spot there. So this is a very common mistake and it's easily cured by using thimble eye slings uh, in the proper locations. Now this is uh, an example of uh, a site in, uh, in Florida that we had uh, discovered some, same, some of the same problems and the uh, the biggest thing is, is using a thimble, even if it's a Flemish die sling, you can still add a thimble in there. And if a thimble was added here, you can see that that would not be happening. The separation in the strands would not be happening, that D to D ratio would be maintained, and that sling would not be derated. So the second thing is the choice of blocks. And I think uh, the main thing that needs to be considered is, is to remember that you may not realize it, you may not think it, but you're in a high speed rigging environment. We run our blocks at a considerable speed. Uh, some parts of the indus industry, such as broadcast, we'll give you an example here in a second, uh, run our winches at an extremely high speed. So that translates to the rotation of that block. Uh, so you may not know it and it may be a, a simple fact that the person that's purchasing the blocks uh, are not being made aware of the choices they have. So a lot of times we'll have a block like this four inch McKissick here. It's an industry leading standard block. It's it's fantastic piece of equipment but it comes in two types. Uh, it comes in a bronze bushing on the shiv and it comes in a roller bearing bushing on the shiv. So the high speed blocks need to be the roller bearing blocks. The problem with the bronze bushed blocks in the shivs is there are very small grooves in that bushing. And what that means is, although you can grease that block, that block doesn't have the ability to store much grease in that bushing. So therefore, when you put that block in a high speed environment, it runs out of grease 
very very quickly compared to a roller bearing block. Uh, there's there's other blocks out there that are such as this Rock Exotica. Uh, this once again this is a really fantastic block. It has a sealed bearing in the inside. We take these things apart component by component and look at every piece of them before we use them uh, in the field or before we use them for training at, at Safety LMS. So I can tell you I know what's in, in that block and it's a beautiful big sealed bearing. Uh, it doesn't need to be lubricated. It doesn't have a grease cert on it. The McKissicks do. So in the high speed environment, the choice needs to be roller bearing blocks. And they look exactly the same. So if you don't read the label or you don't go down and request roller bearings when you're ordering these blocks from your supplier, chances are you may end up with uh, the bronze bush blocks. They're considerably uh, less expensive and sometimes that decision is how you end up with that bronze block. Uh, you want to go through and show those examples just to get a visual for what we're looking yeah, at? Yeah, yeah. So, Connor, would you play that winch video? This is a, this is a video I shot uh, in uh, Christmas, Florida a couple of weeks ago when we were taking FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr up a 1700 foot broadcast tower. So you can see the front tag winch was moving fairly slow. This is the main hoist, the main drum on the hoist here. This is probably turning at about 450 feet per minute. Uh, we're on a two-parted system uh, for our personnel basket. So the front drum is the tag and the back drum is the load. This was, like I said, a 1,700-foot tower. So once that is, uh, is finished playing, there's a personnel basket headed up the tower right now. The next you'll see is the blocks at the base of the tower, the floor blocks. And you'll notice that uh, the tag block is moving fairly slow, but the load block is, is really, it's really spinning fast. So this is what happens. You look at the rotation on that red block, um, you do that up and down a 1700 foot tower at two parted, you got 3400 feet of line that's going to go through that block. So, you know, compared to the, the tag block on the other side, moving pretty slow, you know, a lot of guys are, you know, my, my rule is, a uh, rule of thumb rather, is if we have a block that can be lubricated, can be greased, grease it every day. Guys are like, we just greased it yesterday, so it doesn't matter. All it does is get grease all over the block. You know what? You got a, you got a greasy block. That's it. Get really? a rag, wipe it off. How long does it take to do that? Yeah, you know, it's, it's quick. In the it's scope quick. of the day. All of, it is, all of it is insurance. So buy yourself the most insurance you can. Go big with your rigging. Keep your equipment lubricated. Use the right equipment in the right spots. Perfect. All right, that's all the questions we have. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about Safety LMS and the courses and everything? Uh, yeah, I'll definitely take advantage of that. So, uh, Safety LMS, we, we try to be uh, establish ourselves as an industry leader in telecommunications, tower construction, rigging, fall protection, rescue, that, those types of, of courses. Those are the most popular courses we have. We have about 25 different courses all related to the telecommunications tower construction field. Uh, if you're interested in, in uh, attending one of our courses, you can always go to safetylms.com or you can reach out to Ben Bowman at 512-710-5000 or Ben at safetylms.com. Ben is the keeper of the calendar and he will make sure that you get slotted in there. We're also an NWSA uh, practical exam centers at, in most of our locations. So we offer that as well. So uh, reach out, look at our calendar. There's uh, usually competent climber, competent rescuer, competent rigger, uh, probably three or four times a month at different locations. So we'll take care of you. Thanks right. for having me. Perfect. Uh, thanks again to everyone that's watching live and uh, down the road on this recording. Um, if you want to come back same time, same place uh, tomorrow, we're going to go over tool tethering with Ergodyne. Um, and if you go to gme.com slash live or colsafety.com slash live and RSVP, uh, you'll be entered to win uh, some training options and some gear from the other presenting sponsors. So uh, once again, thanks for uh, spending this